I'm going to tell you what, sometimes it's hard to get up and preach after some of these songs. Um, I believe he came in spite of me. You know, sometimes you just hear one line in a song and it just kind of echoes. And the fact that he came in spite of me, not because of me, he came because of him. He just saw my need. And so he came for me, in spite of me. That's good stuff. Well, good morning. If you're a visitor to Riverside, I want to say welcome. My name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Riverside, and uh, I, I'm thankful you came to join us. Uh, I know that it's a busy time. Uh, many of you, like me, probably still have Christmas gifts to buy, certainly have Christmas gifts to wrap or to pass off to your wife to wrap. Um, unless they're for your wife, don't pass them off to wrap if they're for her. So my wife understands that her wrapping job is less than stellar that she gets in her gifts. But I know we're busy, right? How many of you have some sort of family Christmas function uh, today or tomorrow or, thir- or Tuesday? So between now and Christmas Eve, you've got a family function? All right, how about this? If you've got more than one, keep your hand up. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Right? It's, it's just so busy. Life is busy. And, uh, but I'm excited because tomorrow night, for the first time in a few years, we're going to be having our Christmas Eve Eve services. December 23rd, Christmas Eve Eve. Now, when I first came to Riverside over six years ago, I remember the first one of these I came to and I went, okay. I can get behind Christmas Eve Eve, the 23rd, because I got Christmas Eve stuff I got to do. So I can get behind Eve Eve, a special night of celebration. And then the last two years, because Christmas Eve Eve fell on a Sunday, and then last year Christmas Eve fell on a Sunday, it kind of didn't happen. And so we are back with Christmas Eve Eve. And I want to encourage you to be here. We've been in this series, God with us. And all along the way, we've been looking at Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. But tomorrow we're going to bring everything together and we're going to conclude this series, God with us. And here's what I will tell you. This is a message that every one of us needs to hear. And this is a message that everyone needs to hear. So you might say, well, Chris, what time are we having the Eve Eve services tomorrow? I'm happy you're at, you asked. I'm going to answer your question. And that is this. We have two services tomorrow, 6 and 7.30. One at 6 o'clock, one at 7.30. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. Are you with me? You're going to stick with me right now? Here's what I want you to do. Something you thought nobody would ever tell you to do in church. Take out your cell phone. Go ahead right now. Go ahead. You're not going to get in trouble. I'm not coming to take your cell phone away. I'm not going to give you that evil glare like my mama used to give me from the choir loft, that one that would just shoot right through your soul. I'm not going to give that to you. Okay, you got your cell phone out? Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you 30 seconds right now. Text someone. Some of you are like, huh? Call someone if you need to and invite them to come to Eve Eve. You ready, set, go, do it now. Look, I'm even going to do it too. I'm going to be a participator participator. You ready? All right. Now you might say, Chris, I didn't have time. Then we need to get you a phone that where you don't have to do A, C, right? We need to get you a new school phone. Somebody's calling me right now. You know what? I'm just going to answer this phone call right now. (laughs) Hello? <laughs> Hold on. What was that? I want to invite you to Christmas Eve Eve service. Oh. You know what? I'm going to one. Hopefully you'll be at the same one I'm at. So, awesome. Thanks for the invite, though. So, see, what happens is when you reach out to people, ridiculous things happen, apparently. But you need to invite somebody to come with you tomorrow night. I'm telling you, this will be an uplifting time. It will be an encouraging time. And for people you know that don't know Jesus, tomorrow night could be the night. People are more likely to attend at Christmas time and Easter time because they're already wondering why it matters. 
They're already in the spirit. Oh, we're going to sing some Christmas carols? That sounds like fun. Let's go. We're going to have hot chocolate? That sounds like fun. There's going to be cookies? That sounds like fun. Sure, I'll come with you. And so take the time. Put in the effort to invite people to join you tomorrow night at 6 and 7.30 for our Christmas Eve Eve services. You with me? Nod like this if you're with me. Nod like this if you're with me. I'm looking to see who's paying attention. Right? All right, some of you are like, my neck hurts. Don't make me do that again. Well, we are in uh, week four. And again, I told you tomorrow night we will end our God With Us series. But uh, we have been walking through Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. And as we've been going through this, we have seen that names matter, right? We've seen that the names that were given to Jesus matter to who he is. When we look at Isaiah 9, 6, if you want to join me, uh, it'll be on the screen. It says, for a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor. We said Jesus is the Wonderful Counselor because he knows us, and he knows what we face, and he knows what we need. We said that he's called Mighty God because he's mighty over the waves, he's mighty over the grave, and he's mighty to save. Last week we saw that he's called Eternal Father because he offers us access to the Eternal Father who always cares, who never changes, and never leaves. And today we look at this last name in this passage. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Now we understand this because Jesus is the Son of God. God is the God of Peace. So the Son of the King of Peace would be the Prince of Peace. But I want to explain this out a little bit different because peace is what Jesus brings. We're going to see, we're going to see as we look at scripture that Jesus is the peacemaker. Jesus is the, uh, Jesus is the peace giver and Jesus is the peacekeeper. Now first let's look and we'll see this truth. Jesus is our peacemaker. Jesus is our peacemaker. See, when we first were created, if you turn back to Genesis, and we see the beginning of all creation, we see that God created the sun and the moon and the stars, and God separated the land from the sea and the sky from the waters, and God created animals, and God created fish, and God created birds, and God breathed life into this pile of dust that he had formed together and made man, Adam. And God looked and said everything else was good except for Adam being alone. That wasn't good. And so God made him a helpmate. God made Eve from Adam. And so from Adam came Eve. And God did this because he understood that what he created in us was a need for relationship. God created us to not be alone. And yes, God created us to be in relationship with other people, but before we were in relationship with other people, Adam was in relationship with God. The Bible said that they walked together in the garden. And so there was this relationship that existed between God and Adam. But along the way, Adam rebelled. God said, you can't eat from one tree in the middle of the garden. Don't eat from that one tree uh, because then things will change. You, that, you will be disobedient. You'll know uh, good from evil. And then all types of things will go wrong. And Adam and Eve disobeyed. Adam disobeyed. And in that moment, he rebelled against the one thing God had told him he couldn't do. And that rebellion caused the separation in the relationship because a holy, perfect God cannot also be in relationship with sin. And so when Adam sinned, he tore this relationship apart and created enmity, that is, became enemies with God. Romans chapter 5, 10 says, for if while we were enemies of God, We were reconciled to God through the death of the Son. Then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? What he's saying is this. We were enemies with God before Christ, but Christ brings peace with God. Jesus came and he said, you know what? We're all sinners. We've all sinned and that sin separates us from God. But what Jesus did was he paid the ultimate price for all that sin, for all that sin to be wiped away for anyone who would put their faith in Jesus. And when they do, now we no longer have to be enemies of God 
But we can be declared righteous, that is in right standing, that is together with God. Because Jesus is our peacemaker. Jesus brings peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus makes peace with God for us. Now the problem is, we all want peace with God, but we don't know necessarily where to look. The world hears this story of Jesus and they feel like it can't really be that simple. If I have created an enemy out of God, how would God bring me back to him through Jesus? And so what happens is in us and in our lives, there's this deep, unsettled longing in our spirit this chaotic pull inside of us that is desperately trying to get us in relationship with God even when this pull has no idea where to turn. And so before Christ, we try to fill that void with anything we can come across. We try to grab on to anything we can to fill that void. We look at temporary pleasures. We, we say, you know what, I can fill this void in my spirit, in my soul, in my heart. I can fill that with temporary pleasures. I can, I can drink till I don't think about it. I can, I can smoke this or take this and I can, I can just forget about it and I can be at peace. And I can have peace with God. Or if I eat enough of that, then I can have peace if, if it, you know, because I like to eat, and so if I eat enough of that, then I can have peace. And, and we hope that this temporary pleasure, the fact that we can pleasure our spirits and take our mind off of the deeper longing inside of us, will fill our souls. It's kind of like when, uh, you know, when you're really thirsty, you know what I mean? When you're really thirsty, not when you're like kind of thirsty, but like I'm talking about that thirsty that wakes you up in the middle of the night and you can't even get your tongue to separate from the roof of your mouth. You're like, hiss, 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 hiss. you know what I mean? Like you're just, you're just so thirsty. And what you think is, you know what? You know what would be good for this? If I just lay here, I can just, if I lick the top of my mouth enough, my body will create what I need. I know some of you are going, that's disgusting. Yes, it is. But when you don't want to get out of bed, that's what you'll do, right? But that's not going to ever quench that thirst. Or when you're really thirsty. I mean, you've been outside running. I mean, I hear about people who have been outside running. <laughs> it's been a while for me, but calling on some memories. But when you've been outside running and playing hard and exercising and doing all these things that I don't actually do, and, um, and, and you come in, you're like, oh, I'm so thirsty. You know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get a Dr. Pepper because I want those 23 flavors of glorious goodness. What happens? You drink the Dr. Pepper and it tastes good for a minute, but then what? You're just more thirsty. Or you say, you know what? I'm hungry. You know what I want? I want some cheese puffs. And you sit down and you eat an entire bag of cheese puffs and now you have these orange streaks across your shirt that were never meant to be there. And then you get done and you go, I'm still hungry. Because it's these temporary fixes. And there is a deep longing and desire inside of all of us to be connected with our Creator. But what happens is we try to fill this God shaped void with temporary fixes or we try to fill it with personal relationships we turn to certain friends or maybe we turn to uh, ones that we love or want to love or want to love us and we think well if our relationship's good then that'll be enough because what I really need is to feel loved by someone but what always happens is that person fails because that person can't love you completely because that person is flawed and sinful, just like you. And so we turn to fill a hole that was meant to be filled by a holy, perfect, loving God, and we try to fill it with some imitation of a relationship. And we walk away wanting. Or we think, if I can just achieve enough, if, if I can just achieve enough, if I can be the most successful business person, then I'll have everything I need and then I'll be able to do whatever I want. 
then I'll feel good about myself. Or if I can do this, then people will look at me and they'll laud at how great I am in my craft or in my skill. That if I can, if I can learn how to play this song or I can learn how to uh, play this instrument or if I can learn how to draw this character or, or if I can learn how to play this sport and become the very best in all the world, then that will fulfill me until it doesn't. And all we're really doing is shoving square pegs in a round hole and hoping that it'll fill it up. And it never does. Because we were intended and created to be in relationship with the almighty God of the universe because he created us and he knit us together and he made us. And so when we're not in relationship with him, we're actually not just not in relationship with him, but we're actually enemies to him because he is a holy, perfect God. And so God sent Jesus to be our righteousness, to make peace between us and God. Why is Jesus the Prince of Peace? Because Jesus brings peace with God. But he's not just the peacemaker. Jesus is our peace giver. Jesus is our peace giver. How many of you would admit right now your life is kind of chaotic? There's some stuff going on, right? And it's not all your fault. Some of it is of our own doing. Some of it is because of someone else. But just our life is chaos. It's busy. Listen, I can tell you my life right now is absolute chaos. Some by my design and some by sheer circumstance. My life and my family right now, we're set, we're getting ready for winter beach retreat, which is right around the corner, which is a project and a a retreat that we've uh, led for over, this will be year 17, 18, something like that. And, And it'll be this great opportunity for students to come together and to learn about Jesus and to grow and understand what it means to see Jesus as King. And I'm excited about that. But you know what? Because I haven't gotten some things done ahead of time, now it's a little bit chaotic because I got books to put together. I got lanyards to make. I got people trying to get things organized. And on top of that, that's all my own doing by not being on, on top of it like I needed to be. But on top of that, my son's at home and in the last six weeks, he's had an ear infection, the flu, an ear infection, and now pneumonia. Like, it's chaos. And some of you are sitting there going, I'll take yours. Because what I'm dealing with right now, I need all the peace I can get. That would be easy compared to what I'm dealing with right now. I know about some situations where they're looking at this medical situation and that medical situation. And they don't know why it's not working the way it's supposed to be working. And we thought we had this fixed, but it didn't fix the problem. And so medically, we need a miracle. And we're going back and forth trying to trust God, but not understanding. And we just need some peace in all this chaos. I know in this room there are people that are looking at their jobs going, I don't know if I will have a job tomorrow, but my family needs me to provide. I don't know what awaits me when I walk into my job tomorrow. And I'm honestly really concerned about, and there is fear and chaos surrounding your workplace. Some of you in your own home, there is chaos surrounding because of the relationships that exist and the strain on the relationships that exist. And what all this is doing internally is creating chaos upon chaos upon chaos internally. And you're sitting here today going, you know what, Chris? More than anything else I need from Jesus right now, what I need is peace. Like inner peace, peace within. And what I want you to understand is Jesus is the peace giver. Yes, he is our peacemaker with God, but he is the peace giver. We come to this time in our lives where chaos is around us and we try to deal with it in multiple ways. We look and we say, well, if I can just be busy enough, then I can't have time to focus on the chaos. If I just keep myself busy, then I won't think about the chaos. And the problem is what happens is then you get busy and that becomes chaos. And so now you're feeling chaos while you're dealing with chaos. 
And busyness doesn't fix it. So you know what I'll do? Since I can't be busy enough to fix it, I'll just completely isolate myself from everyone. I won't talk to anybody. I'll ignore people. I'll just come into myself and I'll just sit silently on my own trying to deal with it all internally, hoping that just being alone will bring me peace. But it doesn't because you're not intended to live life alone. And so you've gone busy and you've gone to isolating yourself so then you turn to anything. And this is where we turn back to some of those same other things. Anything that'll distract us. Anything that'll allow us to feel like we're in control somehow. Because we want inner peace. Can I just say something that's not doesn't sound hopeful at first but hopefully will feel hopeful when I'm done? This world is hard, guys. This world gives us heavy weights to bear. And this world brings trouble and tribulation and trial upon us. And I know right now you're going, duh. But the reality is that Jesus offers to give us peace. He brings us peace with God, but he also brings us peace within. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, and I don't give to you as the world gives. So don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Jesus offers to give us his peace. And even though he's not walking right beside us in the flesh, we can trust that he has offered us peace and that he gives peace. And he doesn't give like the world gives, where he gives and takes it back. He gives it to us to stay with us. John chapter 16, verse 33, he says this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he says this, you will have suffering in this world. I want to be clear because we get touchy-feely about this verse and we miss this part. He doesn't say you might have suffering in this world. He doesn't say there could be suffering in this world. He doesn't say suffering may come your way. He says in this world, you will have suffering. But be courageous because I've conquered the world. This week, I sat with a family who had a daughter on life support, and this young lady was just slightly older than me. Three children, a husband, a mom and a dad. This family was close to my family. And I sat with them while they prayed and asked God for a miracle. And I prayed alongside of them for God to do a miracle and heal this young lady. And God didn't answer that prayer the way we hoped he would. And so you know what prayer I'm left with now? God, bring this family peace. Jesus, bring this family peace. And do you know why I trust that that will happen? Because I trust Romans chapter 8 where it says God is working all things together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Even the bad things, God is working all things together. I don't understand it. My heart breaks for these three children that now every time they come upon Christmas, they're going to think about losing their mom. This husband who now has three children that he has to raise and, 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 and try to love and, and teach them the truth of God's word and to walk alongside. These parents who have now lost their daughter. This brother who has lost his sister. My heart breaks for these people. But I know that Jesus is the peace Giver. And so my prayer that I have left for them is, God, give them peace. Because Jesus is our peacemaker and Jesus is our peace giver. You know, we sing that song sometime. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin in me. And that leads us to the last thing. Jesus is our peacemaker. Jesus is our peace giver. But Jesus is also our peacekeeper. 
Jesus brings peace with God. Jesus brings peace with them, but he also brings peace with others. First, he does it by commanding us and teaching us this truth that we are to be peacemakers. He says in Matthew chapter 5, 9 in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. In other words, we show the glory of God when we seek to make peace. And so Jesus calls us to be peaceful with one another and Jesus then creates in us the ability to have peace with one another. Because of the peace Jesus gave to us, we should seek peace with others. That's why when we look at Romans 12, 18, we see where it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with who? Everyone. Does this say, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone you like? Nope. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone who agrees with you. Nope. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live with everyone who live at peace with everyone who votes like you. Oh, it just got a little personal, didn't it? Some of y'all have spent more time arguing about a Christianity Today article over the last three days than you have telling people about Jesus who loves them. But we need to live at peace with one another. Jesus tells us and commands us to live at peace with one another as much as it is possible. We can't control others, but we can control us. Why? Because one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And maybe if we focused a little more on love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, it would be a lot easier to have self-control when we deal with others, even people who don't agree with us, even people who don't think like we do, even people who don't care about the things we do, even people who don't like the same things we do. The Bible talks about us as best we can living at peace with everyone, but I want to remind you, Jesus calls us And the Bible calls us to go even deeper and harder to live at peace with one another. One of the most damaging things in all of the world for the testimony of Christians is when we argue and fight amongst ourselves. Jesus said that, or we are taught this in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3. It begs us, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Jesus, when he was praying in John 17, said, Father, may they be one as you and I are one. And so Jesus calls us to live at peace with one another. Now, it's, you know what's easy and what's hard about this? What's hard about this is it means that I have to be the person who is willing, when I am offended, to forgive. Not just the person who, when I offend somebody, hopes they'll forgive me. See, it's easy when we think the other person's wrong, I'm right. They're wrong, I'm right. They're wrong, I'm right. So I'm just going to say whatever I say and people just have to deal with what's right. The only person smiling at the end of that discussion is the devil. When believers bicker and argue over things that honestly don't matter. The only person that smiles is the devil. Because when the body of Christ tears itself apart, the testimony of Christ is hurt among the people of the world. But that's not what Jesus wants for us. Jesus wants us to have peace with one another. He calls us as best as we can to live at peace with one another. He tells us to make every effort to keep the bond of unity through the bond of peace, the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he said, Lord, let them be one as we are one. See, Jesus is our peacemaker. He makes peace between us and God. 
Jesus is our peace giver. He gives us peace within. And Jesus is our peace keeper in that he brings us to peace with others. You say, well, Chris, you don't know what that person did to me. You are absolutely right. I do not. And what they did to you may be so awful, so heinous, so terrible, that they don't deserve a look or a word from you for the rest of their life. That's what they deserve for what they did to you. But as Christians, we don't live in a world of what we deserve. We live in a world of grace. Because if God chose to look at the things we did, which were so heinous and so wrong and so devastatingly terrible and chose not to look to us, and not to ever speak to us or to reach out to us, then our entire, our entire eternal existence would be completely doomed. But God looked on us with love, and he sent us a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, eternal father, and a prince of peace. Today, if you're here and you need peace with God, You've never turned to the Prince of Peace to be the forgiveness of your sin. But today you say, Chris, you know what? I want peace with God. I'm going to quit trying to create peace with God by being good enough. I'm going to quit trying to create peace with God by coming to church. I'm going to quit trying to create peace with God by doing these things. Instead, I'm going to turn to Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to make peace with God. Today you can do that by admitting your sin, believing God sent Jesus to be the sacrifice in your place for your sin and putting your faith in him as your savior and your Lord. And today you can have a relationship with God. We'll have care team people available at the back and at the front to talk with you more if you wanna talk with someone about that. Or maybe today what you need is you just need some peace within because of the chaos that's happening all around you, what you need is some peace within. As we sing, why don't you just stand quietly and just pray and ask God to give you peace? Or maybe what you need is some peace with others. And so maybe what you need to do is get out of your pew and walk over to another seat and grab someone by the hand and say, we need to talk. I wanna apologize and ask your forgiveness. Whatever you need to do to respond, now's the time to respond to the peacemaker, the peace giver, the peacekeeper. Would you stand where you are and respond as you need to?